Are you wanting to create a highly prosperous photography business doing what you love? Or maybe you have a great business already and want to up your game? Then you're in the right place. Master craftsman photographer Lucy Dumas and her guests are here to support you on your journey. Now here's your hostess and tour guide, Lucy. Every artist dips his brush in his own soul and paints his own nature into his pictures. And my guest today is Leon Johnson, who you're going to start to see, oh my gosh, what an artist this man is. And yes, photographers are artists, but he brings it to an entirely new level. So I'm excited. He's a friend. I He sometimes calls me uh, his protege, which makes me super proud. Before we get started, remember to go to Lucy Domus Coaching. Lucy, L-U-C-I-D-U-M-A-S, coaching.com. And you can grab my free ebook or you can send me a message and say hi. So let me introduce the, the great and powerful Leon Johnson. He's an award-winning portrait and fine art photographer. He's currently in Augusta, Georgia, and he specializes in painterly portraits inspired by paintings of the neoclassical and impressionist periods of art. He's also inspired by fantasy literature and vintage BNW portraits. Oh, black and white portraits. <laughs> he began loving art while living in Europe and viewing the landscape and architecture of the region. And he's been photographing portraits since 2015 and worked part-time as a professional since 2017. So welcome, Leon. Thanks so much for saying yes to being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So what, um, you know, one of my questions was going to be how you fell in love with this style of art. Um, but I'd love to know a little of your background in photography. How did you discover a love of photography? So I, I think that I was like many people, I was one of those people who always enjoyed taking photos of things and capturing moments. And I remember taking my kids when they were young, like, you know, maybe five and four to Disney World. And I think I shot like maybe nine rolls of film. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was a lot. And so, I you know, I think that I found a love of photography just because I I think that I have a love of people. I think that, you know, so before I, you know, while I, when I started this journey of being a photographer, I was actually in the military and I'm still in the military and my job was as a translator. And so really my job is learning about people, learning about cultures and bridging the gaps between people and their cultures. And so I think that I really do have a love for, of people and getting to know who they are and understanding. And also, I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a hype man. I love to, for people to succeed. <laughs> so uh, I think that that works out really well with photography and, and my, you know, what I choose to do. Like so, my style. Uh, perfect. So one of the things you'll discover if you're ever anywhere hanging out with Leon is that he makes you feel like you're the most amazing person he's ever met and he introduces you all around he, he has a such a strong sense of hospitality and I know that the people that he photographs must feel so comfortable and welcomed and and that they trust him so it, do you, where did that come from I know you said love of people, so duh, but that that graciousness, that generosity. You know, I think that as a person, and I think that everybody can probably identify certain qualities about themselves. And I think in general, I am a, the type of person who likes to see the good in people. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to think that people are generally good. I don't think that everybody's good. I'm a realist, but I... I like to see the best in people. Um, I always want people to succeed and want people to be the best that they can be. And I, I generally fill my cup when other people succeed. Um, 
I have a, an interest just in, in people in general. And I, I think that whenever, I think that, you know, as a kid, I was a kid who sometimes I was bullied, you know, definitely a, a lot of that. And so, right. So now I think that I am one of those type of people that always roots for the un underdog mm. and that's in life. That's movie. I always root for the underdog and sometimes uh, definitely as a photographer, people and some of my clients, they are at maybe a certain point in their life where they feel like the, like an underdog. And so I like taking that role of a trusted advisor and helping them defeat some of their challenges or overcome some of their challenges. And that's a role that I love. I love like helping other people succeed, mm -hmm. seeing other what? people succeed. So I noticed you used a term, trusted advisor. Do you remember where you heard that? Absolutely. Um, that is from Donald Miller. And wait, I, mean, I, think, wait. I think that you introduced me to that. <laughs> well, it's, so you I'm introduced doing, me. I'm to trying to do a trusted <laughs> plug. I mean, a shameless plug. So, yeah, I mean, you introduced me to uh, the story, the book, The Story Brand, which is Donald Miller. And, and I mean, it's, it's probably one of the books that has changed my outlook on what we do and being of service. And it's a great, it's a great book. And I mean, you know, of course, you know, thanks for introducing it to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so and maybe you don't remember that my whole, because when I just heard the word trusted advisor before, uh -huh. I, like I've never even read Miller's book, uh -huh. but the concept of sales and how we create a relationship where they trust us and then we are in a leadership role right in our sales and and in you know like i'm sure you advise people on what to wear and right. how to stand that that they lean into and they trust us so uh yeah that to me is the core of everything when we are um creating connections with people and wanting a response from them whether it's ordering well or posing right well i i definitely and i think a lot of people you know don't like being salesy mm -hmm. and so uh instead of being salesy i find that when you are being in being of service when you are when you're just that hype man when you're just that cheerleader when you're that person who is in their corner not you know, making these decisions to uh, maybe make a better sale, but you're making these decisions to help them uh, get to the point that they're that they're trying to get to, and to help them along in their journey. And so, when they see that you are, you know, genuinely and sincerely like on their team, then uh, I mean, then you, then you are that trusted advisor. And then you're on their team and not like someone right. who's trying to, to make a sale or something like that. Right. Exactly. So, yeah, totally agree with that. Um, so since we're into sales, because I have other questions that don't relate, but currently, what is your average client going home with? What what is the product you provide beyond the image capture? So. I think that, so typically when I talk to my clients, uh, I talk to them and I've learned, uh, and I, I think I maybe learned this from you as well. If you don't want to sell something, then don't sell it. So <laughs> uh, I think that we sell what we love. And so there are two ways that I like to see my work. I like to see them in, in beautiful albums and I like to see them on the walls of my clients. So I love wall portraits as well. And so typically when I'm on the phone with them from that first initial call, you know, I I tell I start kind of uh, preparing them and kind of uh, I would say grooming them to this type of sale or or the type of product that I sell. So I I'll ask them, well, you know, what is the how would you like to enjoy your photos? And so I can also tell them that, like you know, typically with what I do, uh, most clients will either uh, enjoy their photos as either a collection, like in an album, or as a wall portrait. So I think that you know, generally, most of my clients are going home with like an album and maybe a, a few pieces for their wall. Nice. So I like how you said you introduce them to the idea 
Yeah, yeah. You, you start early. Yeah, because uh, what I find is people don't always know mm -hmm. what they want until we present them with what I loved what you said is, well, typically, here's what most people do. That is a very powerful statement. Right. Um, I went out to an incredible dinner last night and I said, okay, what's your claim to fame? And I really don't like when they say, oh, everything's good. Right. Like, how is that helpful? Or what, even, even if they say, what are you in the mood for? I'm mm -hmm. not always sure because I might be in the mood for steak, but I'm in a seafood restaurant. So I don't, I want to eat their quintessential seafood dish. Right. So she said, um, well, in appetizers, this one's really popular and here's why. And she was absolutely our trusted advisor. And we had uh, this and it's only a mile away and I've never eaten there, but we had this incredible meal at a place in San Diego called Cora's. And it has been awarded uh, like Italy's Michelin star or something. Uh, anyway, so yes, trusted advisor includes advice. <laughs> so I'm wondering, Leon, how you, like, was there a moment that you were in a gallery or you were looking at a book with photographs or somebody's house where they had a poster or something where you went, oh, I want to photograph women in this style. But was that something that, like, do you, did you have an awakening yeah so i i think that i did have a pivotal moment like uh, i'm a i'm a child of the 80s and so i definitely grew up with like 80s movies like clash of the titans uh conan the barbarian of dragon slayer and all of these were very you know very romantic movies and and so i think that at heart i'm definitely romantic and so one day i was watching the hbo series rome and I saw the beautiful garments that they had in there. It's like neoclassical garments showing like the collarbones and they were made with like natural fibers. And I, I was like, wow, I would love to photograph someone like that. And so from that point on, I started to look for garments and, you know, find both retailers as well as, uh, you know, eventually costume makers who could create the garments that... Uh, that I wanted to 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 photograph, and that morphed and then grew into uh, my style. Like typically with my clients, I'm providing probably ninety eight percent of the wardrobe, and that works well for me because then I know ex I know the you know exactly what I'm shooting uh, during my consults. I can you know I show the clients like, hey, this is what you'll be wearing, and that that gives them a chance to see like, oh. It looks different, you know, in photos than it does in real person, in real life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there, there are tons of conversations that you could have. They could even try it on at the consult if they wanted to. And so I, I love being able to kind of, you know, prepare them for a success for, at their photo session. I love that movie, too. Or that it was a series, right? Yeah. And, Absolutely. and I was between the the costuming and the draping and then the hair, the way they did yeah. the braids and different things yeah. and the lighting in that definitely uh, created a mood. Um, what I also notice in your work that is reminiscent of paintings from a couple hundred years ago is that that era of art, um, I'm not... I'm not sure if it's Baroque, um, but they leaned heavily on the Greek and Roman idea of beauty. Right. Right. So, so was that something that you consciously discovered or was it like you were doing these and then you realized, oh, I'm actually taking those elements that were taken, you know, 100, 200 years ago. Like, was there some awareness in that so my background before even joining the military I was a mechanical engineer mm -hmm. and so I had I had taken probably exactly two or three liberal arts courses <laughs> other than like English and the writing courses in in college and so I I never I've never taken an art class 
And so my approach was really bass backwards, you know, when it comes to like how to approach the study of art. But I pre I really was, I see it, I like it, and and that was it. Mm. Uh, I, I never asked, I never tried to maybe keep myself within a certain genre or a certain period because pretty much my heart was the determinant as to whether I like it or not. Mm. And so I think I really do love like that Ro Greco-Roman, the neoclassical figures, because for one, I, I love creating timeless portraits. I love creating a portrait that uh, kind of transports the viewer to a different time and to a different place. And so what that really requires then are garments and um, maybe a treatment of the photo so that, you know, the subject really does look like they are coming from a different time in a different place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't really tell if this person is from, if this is a painting from, you know, 1850 or whether this is like, you know, 2020 or something like that. Right. Or whether or not it is one of the the paintings on the walls in Pompeii. Exactly, exactly. I love that. Because uh, when they unburied Pompeii that had been buried in the volcano, they found complete walls of paintings and mosaics and right. things that, uh, I don't know, I think there's something so wonderful about the fact that beauty is beauty. And, it, you know, that we, that there's something, and I don't know if it's because we get exposed to what's come before us. And so we're kind of marinated in it. So then it's going to come out of us. Right. And I don't know how that works. Um, for me, uh, something similar is I, I always go to galleries and museums. If I'm traveling, one of the first thing I, first things I do is find out where the fine art museums are. And my very favorite painter is John Singer Sargent. Do you know his I work? I know John Singer Sargent, yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. he's, his work was from the turn of the last century. Mm -hmm. And he, he photographed uh, middle-class people as if they were aristocrats. And the quality of light and skin tone is so gorgeous to me. and. I didn't realize, and also I like, I think Renoir is probably another influence I didn't realize was influencing me, but there was a a client that I had where we were in her home. It was kind of a fancy house and she dressed her kids in, you know, he, daughter had a dress. He was in a suit. I used window light. And later I realized these looked like singer sergeant might have painted them or that if he photographed he would have done this and I could right. see those influences when I was in no way trying to copy it's mm -hmm. just when we expose ourselves to art all kinds of things get planted in our brains and in our in our artistic um kind of sensibilities preferences Right. So, so I imagine you being in Europe for a period of time and around art. And also, I loved what you said, that you noticed the architecture and the skies and things that are often painted in European paintings. Is that? Well, I, I, I lived in, that? yeah, I lived in Germany for a few, a few years. And uh, I really got exposed to, of course, like the architecture and you know visited all of the galleries there and so i think that definitely i think that my work probably follows a more european tradition uh mm -hmm. but i don't i don't limit it to that because so one of the uh painters like um there was a there was a painter that when i was in san antonio texas i did a, a what i call a spanish painter series so I gathered like all of these Spanish paintings. And, and if you're not using Pinterest, then I mean, Pinterest is like my best friend for trying to catalog and organize different influences. And so I collected all of these Spanish painters in, in one board, 
and Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at them and I found out and I kind of took different components. And that's what I do. I, I'll take a painting or a group of paintings and then find things that I like about them that I want to then, you know, small components that I then want to bring into my portraiture. Like, for example, from the Spanish painter series, it was the poses, to some extent, the styling, the uh, expressions and the gestures, the props, the hairstyles. Uh, also, you'll see in some in some of that series, like the red carnations. That's something that I got directly out of it. And mm -hmm. they also have the use of like a guitar, like from like the from like Southern Spain and Andalusia, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think romantically of those places and those, and those people. And so uh, it really worked well for me in San Antonio because, you know, San yes. Antonio has a majorly Latin population. And so here I was this photographer who was creating, you know, this painterly art um, and this art gave the, gave the people of San Antonio, Antonio, an opportunity to create portraits that were, you know, kind of indicative of their heritage, of their ethnicity. And that's something that not everyone else was doing, you know, you know, and so it's really speaking to maybe what their needs and maybe something that they might think romantically of, mm -hmm. you know, because that, that's exciting. That's romantic to be painted as a, you know, to create it, to, to be, you know, placed in the portrait like a painting and, you know, have it be something that follows, you know, the, the train of history. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. Follow the train of history. What I love about how you describe that is that you didn't find a painting and say, I'm going to copy that. Mm -hmm. You uh, exposed yourself, you marinated yourself. I think I already used that word, but you allowed yourself to become familiar with motifs, with tone, with like the red rose, with the different things that are uh, indicative of, I'm using a fancy word, indicative of <laughs> um, a certain style of art. And then you let your own artistic self uh, create right. with that in mind, but not as imitation. Right. Um, one of the quotes I was going to read, but I couldn't find it again, was from Picasso, where he said something like, amateurs copy and professional artists steal. And, <laughs> uh, and I know he, he wasn't saying that we copy, but that we take those elements. So I love that. I love that. There's a great book called The War of Art, which, yes. also, uh, which, is, which also brings into those components. And, you know, Lucy, I, you know, when you talk about imitation, and copying i'm one of those people that feel like there really is no imitation and copy because mm -hmm. uh i think that when i create something it's coming from my heart and i'm bringing some i'm putting i'm pouring something of leon in there and i think that it's you know when you see one of my portraits you can say hey i think that that's one of leon's portraits right and if someone else takes it i mean they can take elements from it but if someone creates a an exact copy then it then it still is not it's still not me like there's certain things that they are going to miss that you know make it still not me and so i i'm never afraid of people copying and i love one of my greatest honors is when pe when other artists like painters and and sketch artists take some of my work and then choose it as a painting one of my friends on um, julianne jonker uh she took one of my paint one of my portraits and painted it and sold it and I was just, I was pleased as punch, you know, when, you know, when someone, you know, that's just an honor because I, you know, that means that my work is inspiring other artists, mm -hmm. you know, and that's yeah. an honor. It's a, it's an honor to, to be an inspiration to other artists and to other photographers as well. Yeah. Even uh, when we're photographing, like I've attended West Coast school quite often. And usually when you're there for a week with the same class and teacher, you'll have models and you are you know sometimes you're guided sometimes the photographer teacher is just posing and working and yeah. we're choosing to also photograph from our own angles and things and I've been amazed at how absolutely different everyone's images were from the right. exact same models 
in the exact same moments. Mm -hmm. Even like watching a teacher, I would see a moment that I would click and they would click at a moment I wouldn't because right. what they're seeing and what I'm seeing and what moves me is a, is a different quality. So I love that you share that. Yeah, you're 100% right. Uh, I, I am one of those people. I think that maybe being an engineer, being in the military has taught me a certain attention to certain details. Mm -hmm. And so, and looking, being able to look at something and tell differences and to maybe identify certain characteristics or components. And I think that with my work, there are a lot of people who create like painterly art out there, but I think that with my work, my voice is uniquely different from their voice. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my friends, Barbara McFerrin, uh, she I think that her in in my own limited way, I characterize her work as like she photographs, you know, teens and and dancers, and that's really her thing. Um, and it looks totally different. Her styling is totally different from mine. Uh, so when we're creating, uh, you can look at like technically, we may use the same techniques to create our work, to create our pro to do our post processing, but who we're choosing as a subject and the expressions that and the poses that we are directing and 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 coaching our subjects into are going to be uniquely different definitely mm -hmm. yeah yeah so thank you for all of that um i'd like to ask you a little of the how to technical parts okay so, a lighting and then b there's something that you do that creates a certain quality or certain look that I think is a little, a little unusual. And since you are big on sharing and that people can't steal, I have a feeling you'd be happy to share some of those techniques. So first of all, let's talk about lighting. So uh, you're right. It, it's lighting. It's also, you said lighting. So there, I think that there are probably three critical components. There's lighting, there's styling, and there's color. So lighting, I am using primarily like a feathered light. It's very soft. And sometimes when I'm photographing a person, I will uh, shoot a little bit underexposed. And the reason I do that is because like when, when through my process of editing, I'm bringing the light back into the portrait. And it reminds me like of the painting concept of chiaroscuro, mm. of like, you know, of bringing the light out of darkness. And that, and I think that that was one of the original concepts that kind of brought me along to my style. And so if you, if you photograph your highlights too bright, uh, anyone who's done like color toning or trying to add texture to an image, know that like when they're using like a soft light or an overlay type of blending mode, if the image is too bright, then that overlay or soft light is not going to have any effect on those super bright areas. Right. So um, it, it really, so really when I'm photographing it, I'm really photographing my subject with the end in mind. Mm. Uh, so typically like I, I will use a lighting, like a large modifier. I'm thinking anywhere from like 48 to 60 inch, a modifier usually feathered uh you sometimes i'll add two layers of diffusion to keep that light super soft and i also will use sometimes a a v flat in order to uh, make sure that my shadows don't get too deep because you don't you don't want your highlights to be too high and you don't want your shadows to be too dark uh, in, in my work so um, so first of all what is a v flat a V flat. So I go to I go to like Hobby Lobby or Michaels, and I take one of those huge uh, white rectangular panels, like the largest one, and then I tape four of those together and fold it into a V. And okay. <laughs> because, and that's how I make a V flat. And I and I have the V flats in both white and black because you know white when I want to add light, and and black when I want to subtract light. So you use it as fill or as subtractive exactly and yes. it's, it's nice that it's a v because a then you can stand it up right and b because then you can create you can angle, the yeah. light and you can 
you could make a little sliver or right. go larger. And so the light that's going into that is going to be the the light that like right now I have a little little light and uh -huh. it's it's hitting me. But if I had something over here, it could bounce light back on this side if I had a V flat. Is that is that what we're talking about? Am I getting that? Yes. Okay. And so definitely like um and so I use constant lights. I've used uh almost exclusively constant lights for okay. about two. And like I, I've been using the Stella constant lights. My favorite light is the CLX10. And the reason I use constant light is like you said, when you're moving that light around, you can see exactly what's happening to your subject. You can see whether they're getting shadows along the nose. You can see the, uh, you know, what's happening with, are they getting light into their eyes? What do their catch lights look like? Uh, I love being able to kind of, that what you see is what you get type of effect. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> another thing that I've noticed about constant lights for me is that uh, through the process of photographing someone, it's a process and, and you, you're not going to just jump in there and wham, bam, and, and get the photo that you want. Mm -hmm. It's a process of, you know, helping that person to feel comfortable, of posing them and and working them into where you want them. Mm -hmm. And so constant light allows, I think it helps the anxiety of your subject. Mm -hmm. Some people have anxiety about, you know, wow, they're, they're lights flashing and they just tense up with that light flashing. Constant light is just, you know, everybody's comfortable with constant light because that's the light that we use every day. And so when I'm working and photographing someone, it's, it seems like it's more of an interview more so than, uh, you know, than a photo session sometimes. Right. And we have fun. Yeah. I bet, because you are fun. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I also think, man, I wish I had had that option in the bulk of my career in studio, right. because mm -hmm. the worry about, is the flash going off? Is the lighting ratio right? right. My uh, Are my modeling lights matching, um, you know, the image I'm getting? And, and the bulk of my career was in film, so you couldn't check the back. And even when you're checking, it's like distracting. Right. Uh, when you're like, oh, that's not quite right. And you're adjusting. So that whole sense of peace that is as if you're just using window light or using natural light outdoors and how the technology's improved. So they've become brighter. And it, like, I don't think a continuous light is probably ideal for a two-year-old that's running around uh because they're not they're not bright enough to set your camera at like five hundredth of a second. Am I right on that? Um I've actually photographed uh like a one four fiftieth or five hundredth of a second using like our reflex S. So the reflex S is a light by Stella and it has a digital burst. And the cool thing about this is that it can it can it can do that digital burst, which is like a flash at up to 20 frames per second. Okay, now I, and now we're, sorry to interrupt, but now we're not in the continuous light. Now well, you could it pop. Yeah, you could do the same thing with continuous light. What what you, I mean, maybe you're, you're raising your ISO a little bit, but you know, I, I've done it and I think that, uh, you know, it, it just, you're gonna just use it at a higher power than, than I typically use. So in studio, I'm typically using it at like maybe a half or a third of the power. So it's about maybe oh. 4,000 lumens. Oh, okay. But you could you could raise the power up, you know, if you, like if you're photographing like a dancer uh, or if you're doing like pets, I've done pets with it. And so having that constant light is really cool because you don't have to wait for a recycle time for a, a stroke. Yeah. When I first started, I bought, uh, they're called Smith Victors. You probably have, haven't heard of it. Have you heard of Smith? I've Victor? not heard of it. No. <laughs> so it kind of looks like a, a clamp lamp you'd use in the garage when you're right. hammering or something, but it's, it's made by Smith Victor for photography. And then you use a bulb and the, the scary part with the bulb, if you're shooting color as as the bulb as you use it the color changes i'm forgetting mm -hmm. the word for color 
the but the anyway so it might start off really warm and end up cool and it so there was, <laughs> there was a lot of variance in the color in yes the color yes but i loved the freedom of just setting the lights and being able to see the lights and they're bright people trust so, their eyes yes so anyway well thank you for that so soft light lots of diffusion slightly underexposed to make sure that you have detail uh -huh. in your highlights um any uh, other technology technology you know, capture that's... or cameras or settings or anything so to be honest uh i i photograph mostly wide open like i'm anywhere from 1.4 to 2.8 oh wow I've I've also uh, done the same painterly style at f8 or f10. So I, I don't think that your aperture matters that much. And honestly, I don't think that your camera matters that much. What really matters is your lighting, uh, styling. Like typically for me, styling, of course, is something that is like something timeless. Uh, but also uh, with the colors that you choose, you want to choose, or at least for me, for my work, I'm looking for things that give me a certain color harmony to it uh, because like when I look at old paintings I one of the things I notice is that they have begun to yellow and that is because of like the varnish that they applied as it ages it starts to turn yellow and green and, and take on some of those tones mm -hmm. and so when I'm when I try recreating that painterly effect I'm also imitating the effect that age has on that varnish mm -hmm. in my work and so if I'm going to add this green or yellow or brown color toning to an image, then I also want colors and textures that are that will work with the toning that I'm going to add to it. Right. Like you wouldn't have like bright pink neon. Or orange polka dots. No, I would not have neon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking about... Um, that this is a little divergent, but there's a series on uh, public on PBS right now that's the history of European art. Okay. And they were doing, I think it was the Baroque era. Uh huh. And I noticed, and I've noticed this in galleries, but I noticed strongly how these landscapes, whether there were people or not, had like a wash of a blue green in the upper part, if it was a landscape and then very warm in the front. Mm -hmm. And it was so, so obvious as I saw like three or four paintings like this, that I'm guessing that once a painting is done, the artist goes in with some kind of thin wash oh. because mm -hmm. cool recedes mm -hmm. and warm comes towards you. Right. Do you know what I'm talking about? That it if you go to a gallery now and look at European paintings, you you won't be able to help but notice that. But have you noticed that in the past? Yeah, like definitely. Uh, so I so one of the things there I, there's a book by this German guy, and I can't remember the name. He's many years dead, maybe from the 30s. Uh, mm -hmm. But he talked about how we see contrast. And like, for me, I will take a small thing and just hold onto it. Like if I find something that works through, you know, experimentation or whatever, I'll take that and I'll hold onto it. And one of the things that I learned is that one of the things that con that we see in contrast is we see the bright thing against a darker background or a dark thing, you know, on a bright background. So you'll notice that a lot of my work, uh, I tend to have a darker background and the subject is brighter and pops out at you. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I have done was, uh, you know, in my post-processing is to some extent, it has almost the effect of desaturating a little bit of the background. So mm -hmm. that that also helps the subject to to pop out a little bit and it's there's small changes and small things that I do uh like I I've done a, I created a course for uh doing my post processing and you know it was based I had you know I edit three images from start to finish and the students they're like wow I never you know 
they were really surprised how some of the small things that I did had such a great effect. Like, you know, some of those small changes in dodging and burning and and how you're treating your highlights, um, all, those things have large effects, you know, when you look at the overall image of it, you mm -hmm. know, the overall image. So is that course recorded and available for purchase? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll give you a, I'll give you a link to it. Um that you that I guess you can add to maybe your show notes. Okay. Um, if they go, you know, at the end, I'll ask you how to get in touch with you. And so okay. and maybe you can also say it there um, okay. or some easy way. Uh, so I know that you have decided to do a coffee table book. Yes. And there's lots of ways to do that. And there's ways to make money. Um, and it's not particularly by selling a book. Right. Um, so first of all, what's your main goal? What's my idea? <laughs> yeah, well, what's the reason for, for the So book? I know a lot of I know a lot of photographers who do like a 40 over 40 or 50 over 50. Uh, and so like for me, I don't think that like I don't identify with people just on by virtue of their age. I think that I identify with people much more because I see the beauty in in different people of different ages, of different sizes, and I connect more with them on that level. So I started a small series that called that's called Bodies Are Beautiful. And it's based on the premise that, you know, you know, getting people to see the body that they're in now and and loving and seeing the beauty in themselves. And and that's I think a lot of my clients, they come to me because maybe they haven't seen themselves as being very feminine or very beautiful. And so what I really do, and it's, it's I mean, it almost sounds arrogant of me, but like, uh, I really let them see how beautiful they are through my eyes, like when mm -hmm. I'm creating. And so uh, the Bodies Are Beautiful project is a project where like, I'm showing people how be the beauty that I see in them you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, like even my wife, even, a lot of times women, you know, their loved ones will tell them, oh, you're beautiful. Uh, but then they don't believe them. Right, right. Because they feel like, oh, this person is obligated or they have to or they're just being nice. Mm -hmm. But then when they I think that when they see themselves through my eyes, when they see the beautiful art that I create out of them or with them, I, I think then they can start to it's like they open their eyes and they're like, wow, I've never seen myself like that. And mm -hmm. all, and even like, you know, no women, no woman likes their arms. No one likes their roles. But then when they see those beautiful things in art, then they can maybe appreciate them as a third person, as a viewer. And I think a lot of times they, you know, maybe they beat themselves up over small details that only they see, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that, seeing themselves you know portrayed artistically and beautifully is some you know it's a step in allowing them to say wow you know the thing that I've seen as a liability for so many years maybe that's actually you know a positive maybe that's something that is beautiful right know? yeah that's such a gift yeah. and so I know that's your heart reason but My is there a reason. practical reason yes. that has to do with money or publicity or some like why uh create a book why create a book i mean because so, you do that with everything you do you yeah. help people see their beauty and the beauty of others but why the book what's the oh i have an idea i'm going to do this book and here's how it's going to serve my business so i'm, I'm kind of going out on my own with this because i don't think anybody that i've seen has done this before in this in this way most people who do the 40 over 40, <clears throat> they do a gala. And I am not, you know, I love attending galas. Okay, but I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to just reel you back. Sure. I want to know the end result. And the then book. we can unpack some stuff. So what's your hope at the end when you look back? This is what I accomplished. Right. So at the end, each participant in my, in my Bodies Are Beautiful project will have a book of they'll have a book and each person each participant will have their own portrait 
And then on the on the opposite side of that uh, spread, though that person will have their story. And so I want people to be able to share their stories about uh, how they have, you know, kind of struggled with maybe, you know, body positivity and their journey of loving themselves. And so at the end, each person will have a their own book filled with these women and their stories. Okay. And, uh, and so are you doing this for free? Is this a charity? No. Or are you going no. to... So yeah. I've set a probably a middle entry point. And so the middle entry point is, is like it's three hundred dollars to participate. And that would probably cover my my cost. So mm -hmm. if people only purchased the if, if if people only participated, then I would probably just break even. But we're you know, we're capitalists. We don't want to just break even. Mm -hmm. So but each person who participates, they're going to get a full custom photo shoot for me. That means two or three hours of <clears throat> trying on garments, <clears throat> excuse me, trying on garments and creating beautiful art. And so when we go and choose the photo that they want in order to, that's going to be in the book, of course, my hope is that they'll see all of these beautiful photos. And then also they're going to remember like, hey, well, Leon said, if I wanted to purchase some of these, I can purchase them. And so maybe at the end of the day, I'm hoping that they will not only go home with the book of participation, but also maybe with the, their own beautiful album of art or maybe with like some wall portraits. Okay. So I'm going to plus you a minute here. Sure. Take out all those maybes okay. <laughs> and suggest that you have the intention that you're going to sit down with each client and give them that full sales experience as oh, well. Absolutely. absolutely. And that, that they will certainly want art and books. So right. I just too many maybes in there. <laughs> I, I use maybe, but like, you know, it's, it's kind of a coy, maybe, right. You know, but it's your intention. Maybe, but yeah. Okay. Maybe okay, I'm not yeah, but the intention that. for doing the books it, book is income in a way that's also going to have a lot of benefit. And right. that it's going to be fun and right. also having a book to be able to say, I published this book. You no, know, it's a feather in your cap. Right. Am I on it's, track with that? It's definitely a passion project. Yeah. Well. Now, do you know why people do it a, like a 40 over 40 and choose a target age? Or I, maybe I, I'll I, just tell you my thoughts, but so there's a thoughts, reason. Yeah, my thoughts is that those age groups are the age groups that are most likely to be what we call unseen. Like, you know, many no, nope. no, nope. uh -huh. nope. nope. okay, no, nope. what's, what's your feeling? They're the ones with the money. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's important. You can too. photograph 22 year olds. <laughs> and, and also, they're the ones that are feeling so I am pulling in on, on what you said a little bit. It's a it's a time when women are feeling a little insecure about themselves and their beauty. So the likelihood that they are a target client is much higher than if it's anyone in general, then you might get a lot of beautiful women that are used to being photographed, right. looking fabulous at 24, working at, I don't know, target or, um, Although, of course, there are professional women in their 20s. I don't want to discount. But uh, the the desire and the demand and the finances to purchase and even the homes where you could imagine having three wall portraits in a home is statistically less likely with a younger woman than a woman that's been around a while, established her family, you know, in a in a larger home so That's it's it's a strategy um but it doesn't mean that opening it up to just women doesn't have a positive strategy as well right if when you're soliciting for those not soliciting like that <laughs> when you're reaching out where you're reaching out um my recommendation is that you reach out still to communities where they have the resources financially 
that it's not anyone in Augusta, but that you target your ideal clients and then it turns into a win-win and then they refer you next round. You know, you let your, the people that love the experience, you let them know you're doing it again and they'll tell their friends and their friends will be target clients and so forth. Does that making sense? It makes a lot of sense. Uh, what I've what I've found um, as far as the people who come to me and are end up being my clients is that they are not always the most wealthy people. But what I consistently see is that they value art and they value like what I do. Right. Um, I mean, of course, like I, you know, I've had you know doctors and you know lawyers and and very wealthy people uh become clients but sometimes you know maybe the value of of the art and what i do is not there but i i've had a 25 year old who you know i had over a 10,000 dollar sale sure you know you know yeah. she she's a professional but at the same time it's it's a question of value so i think that there's a mix of both uh there's definitely value and a passion for and, and a love of art but also definitely like that financial capability but I think that pe things that really matter to people they're willing to pay for right you know, if they to... if they have the resources if they have if, the resources it, you know you, won't, you wouldn't necessarily want to do this with college students who are on scholarships that work three jobs to pay for their schooling you could but to ensure that this is going to work out the way you want right i recommend you know going to where the bigger fish are right. and but something that you said that i totally agree with the really wealthy i've found are not usually my best clients right that um i'm not quite exactly sure why that is but it's um, people who have a certain amount of extra money at the end of the month or the end of the week that they can just play with and go on vacations or buy the newest iPhone or, um, you know, the reason why and, those, the reason, I think the reason why is because wealth in, in no way points back to one education and values. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that my clients tend to be more educated. Um, they tend to right. be people who read. They're they're people who who are very romantic, and I think that you know those qualities. You know, a person who makes a lot of money. You know, that doesn't really indicate how they feel about those things. Right, right. And I, I've like there's a wealthy area in San Diego called Rancho Santa Fe. And it's a pretty closed social community where like they're really like who's who and and the and you know that's a big generalization, but often it's the importance of having impressive things. Oh. And unless we've created an I think you are fully capable of creating this. Leon, I know you're well on your way, but um, unless a photographer has created a brand where it's like anyone who's anyone has a Leon Johnson portrait, like that it's a status symbol, unless we're a status symbol, financially, the next level of sort of cultural I, I what's the word um because it's not always about money but there are people who we used to call it the carriage trade that would only buy name brands and they love to show off their possessions and then there are people that just they love good things they love quality and they can afford it and that's my ideal client right and i've definitely had people who paid me five hundred dollars a month for a long time i had one woman uh, cleaned my house until she paid off 
That's uh, what I call her <laughs> wall portrait because she wanted it and it was a win-win, let me tell you. Yeah. And I I'd photographed her daughter just because she was so beautiful. I I had to. Um and I I gifted her some things, but she wanted to earn that wall portrait and we're still friends 25 years later and she says it's one of her uh, most precious possessions. So, you know, so yes, people will find the money for what they want. Right. Um, that's exactly you're exactly right about that. Yeah, People yes. will find, find a way to buy what they want. At the same time, it's a it's a nice idea. It's a good idea to target the people who can easily afford us afford, yeah. when we're doing a project with an intention of income. So, but I'm excited for that, and I know I know there's people that would fly across the country for that opportunity, and I still am planting that seed. I hope you've got this in mind that you have a weekend workshop where people fly in and they learn from you. And then they also walk away with a beautiful portrait of themselves. So I have been thinking like you, you're kind of reading my mind. I'm looking to have to do a workshop in the next uh, 12 months. And right now I'm looking for a location. I, I want to choose a location that people want to go anyway. Mm hmm. And a place where people can enjoy themselves. So I'm, that's why I'm, I said San Diego. <laughs> yeah. San Diego is not a bad choice at all. It's, it's yeah. a beautiful city, and it's on the beach. Right, and um, heck, you could rent my vacation rental that's behind my house. There we go, and set that up as both for teaching, and then uh, we could make it work for photographing. I used it for my studio for twenty years. Wow. photographing babies and then uh, realized I wasn't using it much. I was doing more outdoors. And so I set it up for just an adorable vacation rental and we're near the zoo and downtown and the beaches. Nice. Um, but yeah, it'd be so fun to have, have a little workshop up there. Hear that? We're going to Lucy's. Going to Lucy's. <laughs> I like it. Okay. I think that is all of my questions except for two. Okay. So number one, how do we get in touch with you? What's the easiest way? So on Instagram, I am LJ Portraits. That's L as in Leon and J as in Johnson, but LJ Portraits on Instagram. Uh, and my website is www.leonjohnsonphotography.org. Org. Okay. Yeah. And so how do they find your um, class that they could purchase? So if you go to my website and then you go to www.leonjohnsonphotography.org forward slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E, oh, uh, nice. you'll, you'll find the, the course there. But they could also message me also on my Instagram. Uh, I think I have a link in my bio. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So last question. Either yes. there's something you were thinking, oh, I wish you had asked me this. Or uh -huh. is there a parting thought? La so the floor is yours. What's your last word? So my parting thought are to people out there who are just beginning their journey or, you know, or beginning a new journey. Um, I think that we, as like, you know, I, I'm definitely more of an artist than the, than the, maybe the business side, but I think that just like in anything, uh, try and try again, you know, have, have a goal in mind, but, you know, work at that goal. And I use that approach in my photography. Uh, you know, I'll see a concept, and maybe I'll try that concept like eight times with eight different people until I get it right. Uh, but it's that perseverance and uh, determination that really helped me achieve things technically and getting like the, the result that I want. It's not by happenstance. So have fun doing it. Do the things that you love. Uh, have fun. Let your heart be the guide but also make sure that you're valuing yourself and valuing what you do. And then I think that you'll attract people who, who value you and what you do. I love it. So keep at it. Don't give up. Try Thank and try again. Absolutely. Thank you, Leon. Uh, I want to remind people to stay tuned for my quick wrap up, although it'd be hard to wrap this up and give you a summary, but Leon, it's <laughs> just been a joy. It's been a joy to know you. It was so fun to, 
to coach and mentor you and to keep watching you grow and to, you know, see people like when you walk by, they go, we're not worthy. And I'm like, oh, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the thing is, you're so dang humble and kind and generous. So I love that about you too. So Leon, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Well, wasn't that fun? And it's sometimes more challenging to have a guest that is my friend and somebody that I've mentored, but that is also such a great mentor for others. Um, it, but maybe you didn't notice because <laughs> I, I like to just sit and jaw, but I wanted to pull out of him so much of the wisdom and things that I don't know about him. So uh, let's see if we can have a little quickie wrap up. Um, he he was inspired by the movie Rome. It's a it's a series, not a movie, and I'm sure it's on some streaming platform. It was beautiful, and the clothing, the lighting, the hairdos, uh, just sparked something in him. So, challenge for you all is to um, notice where you're inspired, and um, I know that a lot of photographers will say, "Yes, I love this genre of." of movie or books or music and that that's why I started creating what I create. Um, he is influenced by art, but he doesn't copy it. Um, and the technical aspects, <clears throat> he likes soft feathered light. He has this big soft box. Is this? Very there. Um, he uses V flats, Stella lights. He is sponsored by Stella and they have beautiful equipment. Um, he uses constant light. Sorry about the phone ringing in the background, but perfectly imperfect. That's my motto. We talked about color harmony and the importance of that and how he will desaturate a background. He has a course to teach that. We talked about his book called Bodies Are Beautiful that he's creating, um, and so many more things. We talked about the influence of art, and um, yeah, just, I, I guess, listen again if you want to take more notes. Um, and his last thought is, number one, to keep trying, keep going forward, don't give up, and to value yourself. So thanks in advance for going to Lucy to misscoaching.com. You can find a link there to get in my private Facebook group to get my little ebook. Um, if you're coming to San Diego, let me know and I can uh, let you know how to how to um, book my little vacation rental that's above my garage. That's very cool. <laughs> and um, okay, until next time. Bye. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one -on -one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.